Welcome everybody to this uh, evening of uh, celebration of St. Bridget, courtesy of the Irish Embassy and uh, Julie LeBanc, our, our expert here. My name is Eamon McKee, I'm the Irish Ambassador and it's my pleasure to welcome you um, to a conversation around St. Bridget. Uh, we have Julie LeBanc with us and I'm going to ask Julie to introduce herself. Hello, so um, yes, I'm Julie Leblanc. Um, I am joining you from the traditional and ceded territories of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, I am originally from the region here, uh, the national capital region of uh, Canada. And um, I have, uh, I'm living with my, my two children and my husband uh, in Get Snow. Have been teaching Celtic studies for uh, 13 years now, actually. The first year started with um, my son being three months old. Um, and uh, I've been teaching both the uh, introduction to Celtic, uh, uh, to the Celtic world to uh, students who want to learn more about Celtic studies at the University of Ottawa, but also Celtic women, which is befitting for the talk that we're going to be talking today with uh, St. Bridget and the goddess. Great. I, can I ask you, though, what, what attracted you to the, the folkloric sort of side of, 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 our, of our culture, of our civilization? I mean, to devote yourself to that. What, what kind of drew you to it in the first instance? Um, a lot of it has to do with family roots. <laughs> so I've got this mixed right. heritage, which actually does have the roots uh, part on my mom's side. So my mother's uh, mother's side, she's uh, actually, she hails from a, a line of uh, Blake's family. So I wanted to learn a little bit more about that side of the family. And I became very intrigued uh, that there was actually a Celtic studies program at the University of Ottawa. I started learning Irish from a man from Kerry. And I said, one day I'm going to go and do my master's there. And I ended up doing my master's at Trinity College in Dublin. And it was on Keating women. So part of my uh, background, which was more interested in history and also kind of going towards anthropology pushed me towards folklore actually through that particular um, lens when I started reading more about uh, the Keening women and lamentation rights that were uh, uh, very much a part of Irish culture over centuries and centuries and uh, the peculiar ways that they were being written down and how, how folks actually continued to, to persist in that custom. All right, okay. Um, from your studies then, I, I, I mean, obviously the folklore and the gender, was that a, a, particular, a particular, particular strong attraction? It was, absolutely. Um, I was intrigued to actually just learn a little bit more about the women who weren't necessarily being talked about um, through their own lens or, you know, we didn't hear necessarily their voices. It was always men that were writing about women. Hmm. And um, I mean, it started reading about um, uh, Marjorie Kemp and so on. When you're in medieval studies, you kind of go through the glosses of who were those particular women who marked uh, history, Hildegard von Bingen, etc. Um, but then learning a little bit more about how uh, how that place uh, was very important in both the mythology of the early Celts, but also um, over time, how the portrayal of, uh, of women, especially in Ireland, was kind of reshaped and remolded. Um, mm -hmm. I thought that was really intriguing, especially as how people are kind of seeing themselves and how they want to identify with those particular uh, characteristics and traits that kind of waned over time and then resurfaced through resiliency and strength and so on. Yeah, that's interesting. Because in a way, Bridget, I mean, she's a very good example of how uh, how somebody has been formed and reformed according to how society changes. And, and I think we might focus in a bit on that. And look, in the first instance, she starts off as, as a goddess um, in ancient Gaelic Ireland. And we know ancient Gaelic Ireland, Gaelic society begins maybe a thousand BC, but, but certainly in the centuries after that. And so you have this complex society, it's pre-Christian, it's based on the oral tradition, they have a lot of sagas, they have a, the Brehan laws, um, they have druids, uh, and, and poets are very important. I remember Seamus Heaney once saying in Gaelic, ancient Gaelic Ireland, the word had the power of voodoo. This is a very alien world, very different world from us in, in many ways, where do what is what what how would you characterize Bridget the goddess um, in this period? Well, we could probably just if we kind of track back about three thousand years or so in the way that she was actually portrayed. The word Bridget itself, the the meaning behind it, is actually something that's been akin to Brigantia, which is actually a goddess term that would have been used also in Northern England. Um, and she kind of you, you hear those those uh, those root names that kind of pop up. 
in Scotland, on the Isle of Man, and in Ireland. What makes Brigid the goddess very Irish is in the way that she was captured through those particular sagas and mythologies. So um, in the stories of Brigid the goddess herself and, and the feats that she did, she was associated to cattle, to, to a milk, lactation, all the things that kind of multiply as well, which were symbols of fertility and of that feast day that was celebrated for that particular deity. Um, actually, might ask then that the um, the slide on that particular calendar custom might be actually pop up. So it's the one for Imbolc. Remember back on the Samhain talk when I showed the the particular um, calendar customs of uh, that we find during the year. So it can be perfectly separated in four quadrants with mm -hmm. Imbolc in particular, um, which is the feast day of, of February 1st. Uh, it's uh, basically the markings of spring. So during that particular uh, time, what you're, what you're doing is you're, you're going to have rituals that are going to um, honor basically that, that renewal of life, um, recognizing that land is going to bring, bring back fruits and that also livestock are going to have to um, uh, bear young. And, and it's, it's just basically a celebration of getting out of that darkness. And embolic mm -hmm. itself, what it's supposed to mean is both at the same time in the belly, which is this womb aspect, but also lactation. So it's, it's the nourishment, but it's also everything that creates life. So mm -hmm. Bridget, the goddess herself, she embodies that element. And she pretty much is that that triplicity goddess, which is the mother, the maiden mother and crone. So she's she's already cyclical in her own nature in the way that she's portrayed. Um, I don't I don't know if that that slide is not popping up, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Well, I mean, but Imbolc is one of the four quarter days in between the equinoxes and and, and the solstices, so it's it's very very important. I mean, I can understand for a, a primarily agricultural society, a society mm -hmm. that puts uh, where cattle were really the center of all life, of wealth, of honor, and so on, and of cattle raiding, of course. But, you know, what does it say about that society that accords this powerful position to a woman? Well, there were a lot of stories that were actually tied to what women had as rights. There, there was a sense of pseudo, and I'm going to say pseudo equality, because again, in Brehan law, where women were allowed technically to have property, there was still an association with a particular man, whether it was their husband, their father, their son, their uncle, their brother, whatever. Um, so the, the idea of, of this, this, this powerful character of sorts that could actually be, you know, the power of life, the source of life, that could be a part of a society that was being seen as being equal, kind of didn't jive very well with when the church authorities really wanted to implement this patriarchal view of how women should be acting a specific way in their roles in society versus men. So those particular um, realities kind of shifted in how that particular goddess was then being perceived. So over time, when she shifts and and we're going to see with Bridget the saint herself she she arrives in the fifth century so we have centuries of this story of this powerful goddess that's being venerated and worshipped who kind of shifts towards this more acceptable Christian version but she she's rebellious in nature she doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. have aspects of her that fit the patriarchal mode of what a woman should be and she rebels in various ways they're very intriguing some of them have to do with self-mutilation and so on, just not to have to be married off to someone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated by that as well. I mean, sorry, before we get on to that, there was one mm -hmm. that she's, she is kind of, she's a goddess of smithing as well, of, of, mm -hmm. of creativity. I mean, this the blacksmithing is really interesting because in ancient societies, those who manipulated metal in their forge and so on, they were kind of associated with the dark arts. They were often, um, externalized from society. They were often kind of shunned and feared. Is, is that a sense as well that she, she is a powerful figure? Why, why the connection with blacksmithing? You would, you would think a man, but why, why her? No, oh, it's the creativity function that's part of right. it. It's being able to create something. Um, okay. So at the root of it, it's, it's, it's again, it's very symbolic to what you can bring forward from an object. There's, there's um, the tie with her being a saint and, and, and what she did for her monastery. Uh, was again very much akin to artwork and uh, to metalwork, and it was to offer basically a space for women to be able to learn these arts. So 
that was acceptable in that particular sphere because of what she she was able to to bring basically for yeah. that particular authority. And then the other thing I was very curious about was the loss of the eye, this mutilation mm -hmm. in a way, I, because it, we know, for example, in Gaelic society, um, in the in the struggle for kingship, you couldn't be a king if you were mutilated. So very often in in these contests for regnal power, the, you would be blinded sometimes by your brother. In fact, if uh, and it was quite savage in many ways. She loses an eye, but then in a way it, it reminds of us Odin, who, who gets his power from the one eye, you know. Is that what we're tapping into here with that mutilation? Is that an overlayering or something? You could see it that way. Um, <laughs> there is also, though, an aspect of the fact that she, she does this because she wants to save herself from a forced marriage. Right. Um, so her upbringing, the saint's upbringing, um, we're talking again, fifth century. Her mother was technically a, a slave. She's a Kumal. So she, she was devoid of certain rights, even though technically she was impregnated by a noble Leinsterman. Um, and well, just, she was hold on a second. just one second there, yeah. Julie, for our listeners. Mm -hmm. We've moved now from essentially a mythic Bridget. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking about an actual yeah. historical person yeah. who has a birth, a year of birth and year of death. So now we've got this. Saint Bridget, born, as you say, of a Druid uh, father and an ordinary woman, mm -hmm. in particular circumstances, you're now going to describe of her birth. But we're now talking about an actual historical figure. Yes. Yes. And actually, that self mutilation story is tied to that figure. Right. Whether it happened or not is, again, another aspect of, you know, whether you believe it. The idea behind it, though, is that she was able to actually restore uh, sight. So she had right. healing properties. And again, with the any form of saint, you need to be able to do miracles and feats to be able to be recognized as a saint. And in her vita and her uh, stories of, of what she did, a lot of those crossovers were actually tied to those earlier forms of what the Bridget the goddess did. So again, she continues to be associated with things like milk and mm. the goddess was associated with beer as well. And with beer, when you think about beer, bread, uh, you think of yeast and what does yeast, yeast multiplies. So it's this idea again of reproduction. It's very, very right. symbolic. Right. Um, but essentially Bridget, the person herself and, and the stories that were tied to her was that she rebelled against wanting to be married off. And her brother was telling her if, you know, that eye in your head, if you're not, if you're not listening properly, you're not going to be, you know, um, uh, a good marriageable uh, um, uh, wife if, if you don't actually fit the mold etc and she says well you know what if that's going to be the case I'll just take my eye off and she does <laughs> that she takes it out of her head and she pops it away and and even today there's actually some spaces where you can actually go visit sacred sites where they have stones that have markings that apparently is where she had placed that eye right. um, again this, there's stories that are tied to it. These are the legendary aspects of, of St. Bridget, but the essence of it was, again, that refusal to actually um, abide by a, a specific norm or cast of norms that was tied to what she needed to do as a woman. And she decided, no, I'd rather mutilate myself. And that mutilation just basically made her unmarriageable. So was, right. she was right off not there. And because of that, then afterwards, she was able to restore her sight again, right. healed herself. And became right. <laughs> And then uh, she was, she was, uh, she, the, the birth was a bit of a surprise and she was uh, sy mm -hmm. symbolically bathed in, in, in milk. She was, she was. And again, this is, this is another perfect example of how that goddess Bridget kind, kind of comes into uh, the saint life. So she was, she was born, her mother basically uh, was going into labor as she was carrying pails of milk to go bring to the druid. The druid was technically her stepfather. Um, and uh, as she was, she was carrying this milk, this is where she gave birth to Bridget. And the milk was actually used to bathe her in a way that was almost like a baptism. And she became associated to that particular milk that was from a specific cow, a red-eared cow, and could not drink any other form of milk. It had to be from that specific cow. And that's the root as well that goes back to the sacred bovine, the sacred cow of these early uh, uh, Celts who actually did worship the cow and mm. venerated them in many stories. When we hear about the cattle raid of Cooley with Queen Meave yeah. and Alil, right? So. 
a lot of these particular traits and these tropes that were associated to the stories were then infused into that saint um, right. and now being a part of her miracle and how she came to be. Right. So then at what point she then builds some kind of a wooden cell, probably wood, we think, under an oak tree, which she loved in, in, on a ridge in the Curragh. What, how, uh, what, what's the story of her becoming a Christian, a nun, effectively? And uh, how, does, how does that begin? So after that self-mutilation and healing herself, um, one of the properties that for, for, um, for Bridget was to become a nun, if she wanted to be her own person, basically. Um, and so, yes, she founded um, the Church of Kildare at a site where, again, Kildare, which is the root for Church of Oak, the oak tree, it's not a coincidence. It's very much tied to um, Druids and uh, the fact that it is considered a sacred tree. So we're again making references to her Druidic upbringing, upbringing and also this, this pagan past mm. and how it's a part of, uh, of British's life. And at Kildare, what she ends up doing as well is that she, she ends up tending to a, a site that had been already worshipped prior to um, Christianity, which was a pagan site, and it was a fire temple. And women tended to that particular fire, and she continued to tend to that fire. There were 19 nuns and herself who continued to tend to this particular fire. I don't know if we can actually bring up that, that image, but if, if, um, if folks want to be able to go see what that temple looks like at Kildare, um, it's, um, it is a ruined site that you can actually go and visit, but um, the fire, the embers themselves, there's still a fire that's supposed to be burning perpetually. The story behind it was that for 10 centuries, it never burnt, uh, it never burned out. So any man who would actually approach that particular fire, um, the limbs that would be the closest would start to wither. So it was a protective fire. It was something to, again, guard um, the women. And when you think about the idea of how this particular church was set up by, um, it's one of the first churches by, set up by a nun, and it was to protect women. It was to offer them uh, refuge and a place to learn. Um, and considering that there were, there could have been some violations that would happen, that fire served as a type of protective measure for those particular women. Ah, interesting. I read somewhere that there was a there was a, a bush or briar around this fire as well, and that's what mm -hmm. men couldn't cr weren't allowed crosses, and if they did, yeah. at their apparel, and again, sim yeah. sim symbolism there. I presume you know their uh, Gaelic society at, the, at this period is is very uh, hierarchical. There is there is, I take it she is aristocratic. I mean she she's got some means by which she can either afford this herself or have sponsors or patrons. Presumably she is aristocratic, isn't she? she well, it was a nobleman who actually was her father. He right. didn't recognize his, her mother um, as, a, as an official wife. She had to leave. But then eventually he accepted his daughter. Right. So, you know, she comes back into the family and, and there's, there's definite ties with chieftains and she has brothers as well. And so that particular line and that kinship was very, very strong. And so, yes, she does have those noble ties um, as well. The fact that her stepfather was considered a Druid, not everybody could be a Druid. You needed to be of a specific caste as well to, to become a specific Druid and right. take many years to, to learn specific arts and so on. So she had an upbringing that in the stories are very, very supernatural and otherworldly in a sense, but also very much reflective of, yes, that hierarchical society. It couldn't have been just anybody who could have become Bridget. She needed right. to have that particular stock behind her. You see, this is kind of fascinating because we know when the Christian monks come in the fifth century and they bring writing and we start writing down all of this oral civilization. I mean, it's quite, a, I'm always fascinated by the idea that before the monks came, before writing came, this society memorized everything, memorized, you know, the Brehams memorized the law, the Philly memorized the poetry, the genealogy, the histories, all memorized. It's like a mind pass. But the one corpus of knowledge that the monks refused to write down is the Druidic. They're mm -hmm. wiped out of history. And yet Bridget, because of her parentage and her powers and her, her immersion in nature, in a way, she's the one part of that druidic tradition that that the church can't resist that she takes that with her is that a fair characterization it is a very fair characterization um the oral histories themselves have been 
very much a part of how um, culture survived basically for the early Celts. Um, and yes, they didn't write it down. Um, and um, the only form of writing really that was actually happening with the Druid cast was Ohm. So we yeah. find those notchings a little bit everywhere scattered across uh, Ireland on stones and so on. Um, but it wasn't necessarily seen as a type of writing that you would tell stories in. It was, it was in a different context altogether as a language um, and very much a coded system. So the stories themselves, yes, they had to be, they had to be carried out. So you had to, 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 to be a, of a specific, again, cast to be able to tell these stories. And eventually, as the monks started writing down the stories, both in Latin and also in Old Irish, that's when in the margins, we start seeing parts of those oral histories that kind of fit in. And it's, it's where as well, you see how um, both the pagan past and, and this new Christian, uh, it, it doesn't necessarily collide in a very distinct manner. There's pieces of it that kind of overlap. And there's a, an acceptance of sorts of, of this, this older form of, you know, ritualized behaviors that were happening that were becoming, you know, oh, we're, we're trying to change things, but we'll accept again some forms of, of, uh, of worship and customs. And over centuries, it wanes, it wanes, and then it comes back very, very strong at moments where the church needs to be a little bit more lenient if it wants mm -hmm. to have more people to flock to it. And then it goes, it becomes strict again. And then we start seeing in the penitentials, you know, some of the, the penances that people have to do for for specific customs and so on so the yeah. stories throughout all of that just remain so she she's in her cabin she's under the oak tree she's getting a, a great reputation nuns are coming to her she's she's obviously i mean she's known for her care for the poor constantly giving away well, there was a story about was it her father's sword or something that she gave away to, oh, a, poor, I, to mm -hmm. a poor man his father was very annoyed but anyway she's 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 very generous presumably then you end up she's an abbess uh, you know after a period of time presumably yeah absolutely and, and what's really interesting about some of the stories that she does in fact yes she did spend a lot of time with the poor but she also helped the lepers and uh, she fed and she also uh, healed well she to the best of uh, her abilities again um the lepers and Again, stories of beer were associated to her. Um, she is technically considered a patron saint of beer. <laughs> beer. So, a beer, yes. Uh, saint Bridget is associated to beer. Um, but beer can be very nourishing. I mean, with all the people that kind of talk about Guinness and, and what you can get from it, it can be that, that you know, very sustaining. Uh, well, it was, it was quite funny because I remember reading somewhere that when the monks went to Europe off to Charlemagne's court or wherever, and they traveled to Switzerland or France, the one complaint they all had was that the beer was terrible compared to the <laughs> beer at home. The European beer was awful. It was the one part of being in Europe they hated. You know? so <laughs> they obviously did beer well, even in those days. <laughs> yeah, true. The Trappist monks would probably say the same yeah. as well. Their beer was yeah. well, quite lovely. But yes, no, essentially she, uh, she, she tended to the poor. She tended to the sick. She, um, she spent a lot of time giving away as well part of that wealth. So whatever was associated to that particular standing, uh, shared it so she basically became this 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 uh, like a community organizer of sorts right. just making sure that those that were you know falling through the cracks were actually being uh, taken care of um, yeah. and that yeah. that particular aspect that storyline kind of came through but what's also interesting is that she's also associated to to bringing peace so she is she is a peace weaver as they they talked to her and, and right. apparently she would be brought out when there would be situations of conflict and some stories associate with her bringing up a mist while there was conflict that were arising between groups and that would calm people down or taking a few days and trying to negotiate, you know, well, through a situation of conflict. Yeah. So St. Bridget has that role as well. It's very Druidic, this idea of commanding nature. And I mean, that's all through the sagas. But I mean, for her as a Christian figure to do this and it to be fine. I mean, the other dynamic, which is really interesting is that the monks themselves, I mean, the, the, it's a very, it's a very, patriarchal is the wrong word, it's a very macho monasticism, mm -hmm. very ascetic, very assertive. I mean, St. Patrick himself is a pretty tough customer, his Latin is pretty bad, but, you know, he, he's, he's going around Ireland with his aristocratic entourage and converting people. But they, in a way, step back and allow Bridget and her abbey a, a fair degree of autonomy, you know, mm -hmm. they're... Uh, this presumably speaks to her power within that society. Well, again, if she had the backing, the, uh, the, the nobility that was with her, it gave her at least that particular um, 
box to stand on right. <laughs> as opposed to one that would not necessarily have the backing to be able to do it. But yes, absolutely. But she was also non-conformist. So um, again, if there were moments where the, it wouldn't necessarily fit with uh, the views that she had, which were a little bit more, you know, beyond the scope of what was being seen as, as acceptable, um, mm -hmm. she challenged it. Right. Now, Bridget's cross is obviously emblematic of her. Could you fill us in a bit about where, where, that, where that came from? So there's, there's multiple stories, but the root of it really is, again, tied to bringing Christianity into a pagan world. So for her, it was the, you know, we hear St. Patrick was the, the shamrock to try to explain the, the Trinity. Mm. Um, and though technically the, the three foliage is also representative of that, that life, um, the, the maiden aspect, which is again, very matriarchal, but having to give birth and adulthood and then afterwards into uh, your late ages and, and dying and then cycling back again. Well, for Bridget, she did this with the cross instead. So it needed to be uh, forespoked. And she, she actually sat down with the chieftain who was, was not interested at all in hearing about her stories of God. And so she, she found rushes on the floor um, and started weaving this and telling him the story of God. And this is how basically the cross came to be. And it was used as that element of transmitting and basically a missionary type of, of, of element to convert. And of course it's handmade and it's woven of rushes, which again reflects her role as a kind of manufacturer, a maker, create a very creative uh, entity as it were. Mm -hmm. You know, Gaelic society then uh, is not hugely disrupted. It's disrupted by the Vikings, obviously in the ninth century, it's disrupted by the Normans, but Gaelic society pretty much trots along uh, pretty cohesively until uh, essentially the Tudor invasion. And even then uh, it continues because if, if the Tudor invasion causes the flight of the Earls, uh, nonetheless, you still have this incredible continuity in the oral tradition, in beliefs, in bridges, in, in nature. And then we have the famine, uh, the great famine, 1845, 1851, an absolute catastrophe. How do you assess you know, Bridget's role in this, or, or what's the significance of the impact of the famine on this type of society, this worldview that they have? Yeah, we're talking about the Virgin Mary cult that kind of comes into play. And um, so what becomes a little bit more acceptable according to the church is removing that particular aspect of, of what it meant to be Gaelic Irish, what it meant to be also part of this pagan um, pagan world. And so there was this, this, this like, clear separation that was happening between those specific worlds. And it, it lasted for a little bit, but again, there's a little bit of that, that, that tie of wanting to bring back what was the essence of um, the Irish and what meant to actually be able to, to, to go back and reconnect with that particular pagan past. So over time, even though the Virgin Mary kind of replaced St. Bridget, she was not completely erased. She, can, right. she does come back, she resurfaces. And we see a little bit more of this, especially in the past few decades, there are more people that are actually just discussing about St. Bridget herself. But the interest also is to that tie with, you know, what, what it meant for her as a goddess. And why is it that there are traits of that goddess that are actually infused with that particular patron saint? So there's a a, a kind of like a romantic appeal to go back to what it meant to 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 have been um, mm. pagan, but also you know marrying it with uh, this Christianity uh, element. Because it's, it's interesting that Virgin Mary, the cult of the Virgin Mary. I mean, it, it was huge. I mean, even when I was growing up, I was born in 1960. There was a lot of kids who would join the local legion of Mary, and you have the those classic statues of the Virgin Mary with the blue and the white. Mm -hmm in grottos, you have them in churches all over the place. I mean, it was really, it, she was the female deity. I can't honestly say when I was growing up, I was that aware of Bridget, but by God, I was aware of, of, of the Virgin Mary. Mary. She was yeah. the Virgin Mother. She was very appropriate to her time. Mm -hmm. In a way, does this, you know, and, and yet, as you say, Bridget is, is kind of emerging now again as a, as, as a more popular figure. And what you're saying is because she has this, combination i suppose it makes her very powerful 
yes. <laughs> absolutely. Actually, you're touching two on points where um, just if we're going to make some um, little connections too with uh, with Quebec, as you know, a lot of um, Irish influences there too. But um, with um, with a lot of the the, the most of the, the Catholic talismans and the beliefs in, in the Virgin mm. Mary as well. We're very, very strong. The cult of the Virgin Mary is very, very strong as well. I remember my grandmother <laughs> always talking about Virgin Mary. She had talismans all over the place. She had some behind her washing machine. <laughs> she had oh, some. Miraculous, and miraculous it was, metal. Exactly. She had patron saints everywhere. But um, but the Virgin Mary also, it spoke a lot to women of that era because again, it, it's it's what she represented. It's it's And it's very much akin to that goddess and also the St. Bridget part, which is, while St. Bridget never herself had children, she was associated to midwifery. She was also, right. there were stories about her apparently being able to perform abortions. That's being contested with a lot of scholars, but the stories behind what she was able to do with, it's almost like tied to bringing life and controlling life. And so the Virgin Mary herself and what she embodies was that aspect, but also giving a little bit of empowerment to women who might not necessarily have felt, you know, they felt disenfranchised from from what was happening around them and so needed to be able to connect with somebody who understood and so again that that tie was very strong and saint bridget when she comes in she kind of takes over that role especially with the goddess aspect it's very fiery one yeah um, actually this might be a good time to show the mural um so the saint bridget and bridget the goddess there's a mural of her at uh, Fart, which is in County Loud, where apparently St. Bridget would have been a born. Um, and we have a perfect depiction basically of, of that goddess and the saint uh, image. So on it, um, right. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll kind of play a little game here and see how many things you can actually see from that mural. And it's a, it's a nice little wink to the, uh, the title of this presentation and this talk. So keeping it lit, we're trying. We're trying to keep it relevant with people who um, who would like to see this type of artwork, but what they can kind of capture from it. So right. when you look at this particular image, if you're looking at the goddess side, so on the right side, what are some of the the main elements that really are striking? That immediately you're like, yes, that's definitely a portrayal of a goddess. Well, you got the you've got the flame, you've got the the the, the snake charm medicine. Um, I, is that a hilt of a sword? Is she like wearing armor? She has the torque around her neck. Um, and sorry, the, is that a dandelion flower? That... Dandelion, yes, dandelion. And we also had a little crocuses. So the. Ah, oh, spring, of course. Yes. Right. And she's got her fiery, fiery red hair. Every Irish goddess has her fiery <laughs> red hair. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the torque, the torque makes that reference to nobility and, and being like a, a, a chieftain of sorts. Um, the snake, as you put it, the snake or serpent, um, those medicinal qualities, the fact also that it represents um, renewal of life because it sheds its skin. So it's, it's again, that aspect of, of you know, rebirth. Um, and the dandelion, the dandelion also kind of emits a little bit of this milky uh, juice that comes from it. And so Again, it makes reference to lactation that comes to mind yes. and the fire, yeah. the fire that's associated to Bridget um, as a, a type of almost sol solar goddess. So she is that bringer of, of spring and of hope. And so light is coming back. And this is what we're, we're, we're putting forward. And wow. so when we flip it and we look at the, the saint, um, there are, while she's not necessarily, you know, wearing a torque, we do know that she is of that noble stock. So there's that link that's tied to it, but we also see other particular symbols that are tied to her. And she's, she has that cross, the rush cross, but she also right. has the reference to the, 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 the bull. The <laughs> so bull, again, yeah. tied to, to livestock. So and you have kudos the, uh, to the rosary beads I see there as well, um, with the yeah. church. And of course, the bull is is echoes in a way, I suppose, the Book of Kells, you know, that that kind of almost abstract, abstract uh, imagery. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where, sorry, where is that? Is that a gable end? It's a, it's in Fort. It's actually a mural, and I'm I'm forgetting on which particular building that it's found, but um, yeah, oh, right. it's in yeah, yeah it's yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, so this for me actually just was a, a perfect portrayal of this, um, like a, a contemporary aspect of who that 
that Bridget goddess and saint is and and it speaks volumes a lot of people really do like that mural and they get the pieces that are, are kind of tied to her and right. so she's very relevant still today yeah and I really have to pay tribute to a colleague of mine Anne Derwin who was uh, on the management board with me back in back when I was in headquarters she's just gone as our ambassador to Beijing and Derwin has been a fantastic champion for gender rights and empowerment and it was she came up a few years ago with the idea of doing something around St. Bridget's Day. And Adrian O'Neill, who was the ambassador in London at the time, put together an amazing event, a very short time, and proved really popular. It, it, they assembled a panel of women uh, in business, for example, very powerful discussion. They have uh, women musicians, it, just a wonderful, wonderful evening, but it seemed to touch something. And we've seen since, that was oh, three or four years ago, embassies are now, like ourselves, taking up uh, Bridget as a kind of a, a female icon. In a way, it, it restores balance because St. Patrick is very, very male orientated. You know, we've often had St. Patrick societies that are exclusively male. It seems to me that this uh, renewed focus on Bridget is putting back that kind of balance. And, and that that's a very good thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And with a lot of the focus that's actually also being brought forward for gender rights and for reproductive rights. I mean, everything that's tied to basically not just women, but also to the uh, two-spirit LGBTQ2 um, society. I mean, a lot of, of those particular elements and, and of trying to defend rights, defend human rights is pretty much the symbol now of what we see with Bridget. So right. it's, it's wonderful to see those connections that are being made. Yeah. Now, listen, you can't have a discussion about Irish culture without talking about the immigrant experience as well. And before we came on, you were mentioning kind of an interesting uh, dynamic between different views, uh, you know, within, 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 between immigrants and so on. Do you want to just expand a little bit on that? Well, for, you mean that the, um, the Irish coming into Quebec and uh, the legacy there? Or? Yeah, and you were, you, well, you were making the point that some communities respond to the St. Bridget bit. Oh, yes. <laughs> and some respond to the, the more <laughs> pagan DNA. <laughs> So, uh, yes, absolutely. So St. Bridget, because the, uh, the Catholic religion itself being still very much strong with many of the, the, um, the communities even exported outside of Ireland and the states in Canada, there's still a, a, a recognition of that saint and wanting to, you know, lay out the cross or even making rush crosses, but at least having some form of recognition of St. Bridget on the feast day itself. And um, from many of the folk traditions to the uh, stories of biddy boys and those that would actually go collecting and being dressed up very much like what we discussed with Samhain and going door to door and collecting money to basically go and have a party afterwards. Um, those, those were some of the elements that kind of stuck through. And I think that it's more of the, the folk aspect of what it means for the community um, to try and, and continue to kind of build that, that, that build on the belief of, of St. Bridget, but also bringing in those earlier elements of what Bridget the goddess would have been. So it's a perfect marriage basically of both of them, but yes, definitely we see, we see some, some, uh, some older generations who are still um, wanting to focus on St. Bridget and then younger folks who are more interested in the, the deity aspect. And that's mm. their introduction into St. Bridget. Um, yeah. I see that at least with my students at, in um, Celtic studies, there's always a fascination with this deity world. Like, where did they come from? Who are these pagans? And then once they start seeing those particular traits and then seeing how they're, they're being infused into a saint, there's this, this, appreciation basically of what that saint is and the embodiment of it and how it is that, that marriage between that pagan and Christian world together. It's a perfect yeah. embodiment. Yeah. I mean, in a way, I suppose that begs the question of how universal Bridget is. I mean, as a, as a goddess, I mean, so much of what you say kind of echoes uh, other traditions and other cultures. I, 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 I'd be interested in, in how universal you think her appeal is. I would say it's pretty universal. If you think of just an aspect of, of, of St. Bridget being tied to religion, if you make that abstraction and just look at those particular feats that she had and what it meant for her to be a healer, uh, protector of, of those who were marginalized, um, also having those particular traits that were very much deity focused, which meant multiplying foods, multiplying right. butter and beer, um, all those aspects make her, make her, a, a, a comparable you know deity and also saint from from other parts of the world um 
but essentially I, I would look at Bridget, you know, and, and what she, she, she represents for, for Ireland, but also for the early Celts itself. It is that, that embodiment of these two different worlds that can kind of mesh together and, you know, using basically those elements of how you can change things and revolutionize basically worldviews. So mm-hmm. it's, it, is, it is a good marriage of those particular worldviews, yeah. And do you see resonances of not just Bridget, but the kind of role that she embodied for women in a, in a way, a vital role in agriculture, in pro- providing food, in providing medicine, nurture, care, and so on through all stages of life. Is there an echo in, in the kind of the, the culture and mythologies of, of indigenous Métis, Inuit peoples here? Absolutely. Absolutely. When you look at matriarchal societies and what women had um, and still have today, I mean, there's a very strong role and strong presence of women as peacekeepers, as decision makers, um, strong keepers of tradition. Um, Those are elements that are very much akin to what Bridget also represented. And so you do see those parallels that are happening across different different worldviews yes definitely with indigenous peoples not just in Canada but when you're looking also in in Latin America when you're looking in Africa in Asia there's similarities as well with how women do have that functional role but also a very important political role as well and they Mm. they they move the needle on things you know where 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 there's always a defensor of rights and often it is women who end up playing a very important roles in social justice as you know leaders and organizations as representatives and they're the ones that that move and shake things. They're action oriented, um, but they're also organizations that can be, you know, thankless because they don't necessarily have enough funding. Um, right. So it's 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 kind of this repetitive pattern where we see again people who have a very strong will to change, you know, ways that 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 are oppressing and um, don't necessarily have, um, you know, much of the, the the firepower that comes behind them, but. They have with the movement, it can change. It can change certain things. So we're seeing the defenders of rights really being mostly these particular groups. Yeah. I mean, have you come across? I mean, in a way, what you what you say is is speaks in some ways to to male fear about women, male fear about their power, their fertility, and that kind of runs through the kind of the critical analysis of Western society has been very patriarchal, very male, excluding women's counsel. Do you ever kind of come across? hostility and discussions or fears like that obviously from male students or male or male members of an audience uh no actually i've been pretty lucky in the past oh past dozen years that i've been teaching people have been very very open and i've had um funny enough my celtic women class it it doesn't attract as many male students as i would hope it would but the ones that do they tough it out and i have to say it's great to see them go through the whole process because it's it's not a very forgiving class for (laughs) men (laughs) um and it's not to say that there is a it's not a question of male bashing or anything but it is a celebration of that strength and resiliency that women have and and again, it's it's deconstructing the way that women have been portrayed in some stories and how is it that we have this narrative form, women in myth have all of this wonderful power and then suddenly when we hear about their roles in society, it was completely flipped. And yet they were the bearers of life. They were the ones that had to nurture and nature. And it's just the whole aspect of what, you know, even just birth itself is a very, very, um, it's like it's a strong, strong element so it it pushes people in a a very uncomfortable zone but I think that um I've had I've had some male students who were actually quite pleased with how they came out through the class and were quite happy with uh with hearing views and also challenging those particular notions of of you know how how gender roles were very much in this binary realm very much dual and then what it means today how are we changing things how are we making things a little bit more intersectional and so on right yeah no it's kind of interesting because i get that from my wife she says i feel the kids are more mine they came out of me <laughs> i'm kind of being put in my place uh, but I, I there is that kind of sense and then i was i was very interesting i was reading uh jean paul south was very small autobiography Les Mots, the, the words and he basically thanked his father for his absence he says, I never learned obedience because I didn't have a father. Kind of, so you kind of, 
you know, for the male, this is all very threatening that you're actually kind of secondary. You know, you're not really that important. And in fact, you might be in the way of the child's development because you insist on respect and obedience. So <laughs> these are these are big things we have to turn around in our head and, and, and get straight, you know. So but um, what I was going to say, I'm kind of moving on a little bit. You're I'm fascinated by, I mean, bridges and the attraction of bridges in a way speaks to um, the eternal attraction of folklore. Mm -hmm. That no matter how much we modernize, there's still, there's a very deep instinct in us for, there's a place in our hearts for folklore, in our minds, explaining our life or the universe or whatever, we, through folkloric metaphor, through folkloric beliefs. Um, and you've studied a bit about uh, folklore in the modern age and uh, mm -hmm. um, urban folklore. Could you just speak a little about that? Because I think it's it's a fascinating, folklore is a fascinating transmission mechanism as well, but it's a coping mechanism. True, true. Um, but yes, absolutely. Folklore, it's very much alive. <laughs> it's not something that is temporal or um, that, has, that doesn't change over time. It changes over time with the people that actually grow with it. But what's really interesting is that the essence of it, the stories that are told and the beliefs that are tied and if we're using just Bridget as an example, um, they, they don't die out. And it's not because they're necessarily written or even told. It's, again, the markers that you see physically in the landscape. Um, you have even, we were talking about this during the Samhain talk, but the beliefs in fairies, when you see a, a tree in the middle of a landscape, there's, again, this recurrent belief that's still it won't die out <laughs> anytime soon. You don't mow that tree. You leave it there. Well, you have these particular um, cultural markers that are found peppered and scattered throughout Ireland that actually do tie to that particular um, belief in these saints and so on. And for, for Bridget, she, she does have these. And I talked about that stone in particular, but those are spaces where, again, it allows people to, to, to share the stories, to share beliefs and to continue that tradition. So I mean, folklore, where, very live. <laughs> yeah, and a way folklore probably brings us closer to nature when life kind of alienates us from nature you know that we're not kind of in sync with with the rhythms just got a, a question here uh love to hear more about Bridget's uh, feminist role uh do feminists look to her as an example and a second one interested in her role in the church both in her time and now so um her feminist role at least in her time as well and that connects as well with uh with what she did with for the church um she, she allowed for a space for women to actually go and learn uh, different arts. And she, she gave that, that safe space basically for women that didn't necessarily have other types of options. Um, and so that particular aspect made her very different and yes, extremely feminist because she was offering that particular space. Um, and in addition to that, from the, the aspect of, of church, well, again, yes, men were having in, in their particular monasteries, they were also a learned society in their own rights. But it wasn't, again, it was very respectful of what was happening in, in, um, in, in her particular zone. So she, she was able to actually use, again, any form of stories and, and of beliefs that were tied to God as a means to be able to carry out her will and her, in her faith and her spirituality. But at the same time, really focusing on what it meant for protecting women and allowing them to be able to flourish in that world. Right. what it means today and the ties with feminism well again because she rebelled a lot and uh the fact that she didn't want to actually do what was being told of her and expected of her which was to be married off to a nobleman and you know have children and grow in the kin family um so no she decided not to do that and so she 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 changed those particular um expectations and made things different for women and so in that essence and what it means when you go back to what it was for her at that time, it's, it was pretty remarkable. And so when you look at trailblazers and you think of St. Bridget, well, she's, she's a perfect example, perfect role model for that. Right. And how do we know so much about the actual historical Bridget? How do we know so much of her? It's all through the Vitas. <laughs> so right. the, so um, it was actually, again, like many of the stories, they're always written 
centuries later <laughs> after right. the people had passed on. So in the seventh century, Cogitosis was actually the one who wrote about, about um, Bridget. And this was something that was actually charged by the church. So they said, you know, this woman was fascinating. She did all of these things. And then the story is kind of like, they, they expand and they take certain liberties and so on, but this is purpose of the vitas, the lives of the saints. They always take on different forms. Right. Um, and eventually over time, she becomes this larger than life character. And then I've got a great question here. Was she ever canonized? And if so, is she still? So, I mean, because very often in those, those, uh, those early Christian figures all, all, almost automatically become saints. Was she actually, that's a great question. Was she actually canonized officially by the church? I don't actually I don't know that. <laughs> no, I, you know, no. to be honest, she probably wasn't. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you know, I think that for 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 a lot of women, they have to have specific extra tasks that are tied to <laughs> You have to like you know be able to create fire. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think to it is just one thing, but you have to really no. Um, actually, I wouldn't be able to answer that one, but it's a great question because yes, again, it, it does go back to this notion of you know how many women actually were uh what is this notion that's tied to to the association of of you know yeah, I, I to be honest i think it was pretty loose in the day i mean anybody yeah. who founded a monastery or a, or a or an abbey or whatever seemed to be granted the title even saint brendan who sailed off to canada i mean seemed to earn him yeah. sainthood yeah. you know so yeah <laughs> sainthood yeah. exactly i think it's more again in, the, in this the keeping of what she was um, and her ties to goddess, the goddess Bridget. I think that that's really that that perfect mixture between it just made her like this this you know larger than life character that people were just fascinated with. I wanted yeah. to perpetuate stories about. How much you did your MA on Irish medieval history? Um, yes. In Trinity College, did that touch on hagiography and saints and bridges? Uh, I mean, I know you toured a lot around Ireland. I, I yes I did um actually I focused it on Keating women so I did look at um uh, like as I mentioned earlier penitentials and annals and chronicles and so on of basically Sorry, stories would you just of explain for our for our listeners uh, Keening yes oh yes absolutely Keening comes from Irish which means to cry it's Queenu and so the Keening women were both professional and non-professional. So some were paid to go and keen or cry at funerals, at wakes, burials. Um, normally it was associated to uh, important chieftains. So people of sta certain standing. Uh, over centuries, you could have paid a keener if you wanted to have a professional keener come yeah, to your yeah. funeral. It was a, quite a treat to have. Um, but uh, essentially, I looked at, at at their role and how they were being captured through these particular um, like chronicles, annals, etc. And um, it's fascinating because, again, it, it waxes and wanes over centuries. There are centuries where you actually see the church being very forgiving in how this particular custom is being practiced and some of the stories that actually also appear because then uh, we're looking at the 12th and 13th century, wonderful corpus of written literature about the, the Irish myths and, and how suddenly we're, we're seeing those same elements of, of how specific characters like Deidre, who, you know, basically cries for the death of Nishu mm -hmm. and she she does the same types of behaviors as keening women and that's being recorded as well at the same time by actual keeners and what they're doing at burial grounds which are basically they're throwing themselves and so on right so um yeah I focused it mostly on 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 them and and the role that they play but also that powerful you know sense of it's almost untouchable um and also there yeah. were unspeakable aspects of being of being a keening woman if you're a professional keening woman and you were married and you had to go off and keen to someone you had to kind of explain things and it was a little bit tenuous between <laughs> contentious between the husband and the wife in what, sorry in what sense so in the sense that if you were to go and weep um and to be able to add on to to your sure. you would start like basically self-mutilation oh sorry the scratch the tearing the clothes scratching and so on yes exactly yeah. and that that particular uh part you had to actually show some form of sincerity and right. if you were competing with bards who themselves knew the chieftains for example very very well and there were relationships that were also very very close between bards and chieftains um they were recording about competing on the graves with these Keating women. And so they would say, basically, you know, 
you never knew this chief didn't get off the grave. Right. And so they had to prove, oh no, oh no, I had intimate relations as well. <laughs> so that didn't bode very well if they had to go back to their husbands afterwards and say, oh, that was so just you, for show. <laughs> so you, you know, you, you had to be professional and genuine, which there you is go. <laughs> in terms. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suppose the sign of the very, uh, always the fine line that women, <laughs> women have to steer in so many uh, aspects of life. But the Keating is fascinating. When, I mean, it, Keeney went on for, I mean, up to modern times, did it? It did, it did. Um, it was recorded, at least, you know, until the 1950s, there were still some Keating women that were out west in um, the western coast of, uh, of Ireland. And what's interesting is that even though the custom itself kind of died out after a certain period of time, it again, resurfaced. And again, it's that revitalization of Keening, which no longer is within just the realm of women. We actually have male singers who actually do laments at funerals and so it kind of shifted a little bit in the past few decades to take on a more contemporary appeal but at the very root of it it lasted right up until yeah the 1950s right. the unprofessional one now yeah. yeah yeah so just kind of uh, as a, to, to wrap it up a bit what do you think and and put in, putting on you know getting your crystal ball um about uh, about St. Bridget as a festival, uh, will it rival St. Patrick's Day? Will we end up dropping the saint? Should it be just Bridget's Day? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I would love to see a St. Bridget's Day rival St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> <laughs> if she is the patron saint of beer, <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> Put it out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's a great way to actually celebrate, yes, all things that are... Um, a part of women, but also the defensors of rights, those that that speak um, for those who don't necessarily have a voice, who work uh, towards changing things for the better. So I think that it's a good moment to kind of reflect on those particular aspects. So she's she might be a little bit more sober than, than the celebrations that we do at St. Patrick's Day, but she certainly has that particular role. And I'd love to be able to see a little bit more of that, that aspect come up. So not focusing on again St. Patrick's I mean it's it's divorced now from this whole notion of Christianity really it's parades mm. and going to pubs and so on but if if you look at St. Bridget as beyond and again having those cross the the rush crosses and so on that you do and the feast days and bringing out your your food and your and recognizing Bridget to bless and protect your your home for the year those are all small gestures that can kind of you know pay tribute as well at the same time to that goddess yeah, and I suppose in a way that she was such an avatar, an icon of somebody representing nature. Uh, in a way, I think in the with the with the ecological crisis we have, climate change. Uh, uh, you know, the the more we think about nature and our place in in the world, I suppose I suppose the better. You know, uh, I mean, it's it's been great talking to you. In terms of keeping it lit, we should have, of course said at the outset that these great uh, quarter days, there were always bonfires. Um, and there would have been a bonfire on St. Bridget's Day. Um, and and if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, that was traditionally the, the 1st of February was the day she died, which again is that life birth kind of cycle, uh, which, which is captured by, 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 by St. Bridget's Day, you know? Mm -hmm. So listen, great talking to you, Julie, a fascinating discussion and insights into Bridget, really appreciate it. And, uh, Hopefully we can do this again on, on another subject of uh, Irish folklore and mythology. But thanks so much for your time and for joining us here to celebrate uh, St. Bridget's Day. Thank you.